Sure. Hello, folks, and welcome to the latest in the No Fluff Just Stuff virtual uh, webinar series where we dive into a variety of topics. And uh, this week, I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Ken Cousin. And we're going to be talking about some of the, the functional paradigms and some of the, the exciting new things that are coming out of the, uh, of, of the JVM space. So certainly, if this is a topic that, that excites you, if going through this, you want to dive deeper, uh, I do happen to know, Ken, you are doing a, uh, a workshop in this area coming up soon. There are also the, uh, the No Fluff Just Stuff uh, virtual conferences. So basically, you can see here, uh, we've got our conferences September 10th and 11th, October 1st and 2nd, and November 12th and 13th. If you want to get a more rounded, complete conference experience, we also have our destination shows, including our conf and the progressive web experience taking place at the end of November and the beginning of December, respectively. So if you are, are deeply interested in web technologies or you're deeply interested in software architecture, whether that is as a practicing or aspiring software architect, definitely check out ArcConf. And you can see just, just a, a slight breakdown of everything that's coming up over the next week or so. Uh, we've got the virtual workshop scheduled all the way through October right now. And of course, with the virtual workshops, these are live half-day instructor-led hands-on workshops. And of course, uh, you can you can uh, tune into these a la carte and uh, just register for the ones that you're interested in. Or No Fluff Just Stuff is offering a subscription op option that allows you to share that subscription with your team so you can dive into the topics that you're interested in and members of your team can can take advantage of topics that they're interested in. And the entire team gets smarter and more competent as a result. But enough from me and the contractually oblig uh, the contractually obliged uh, commercial messages, let's dive into the content. And without further ado, let me welcome Ken Cousin. Hey, Michael, how are you today? I am excellent. How are you? Oh, hanging in there. Um, we are, I'm on the east coast of the U.S. I'm in Connecticut. So actually, you can see out the window, we actually have decent weather today for a change. That's nice. It is, it is hazy here because it feels like in Colorado, where I am, the entire state is on fire, or at least it feels that way. Well, that's, that would be true in California. I don't know about Colorado. Uh, uh, well, we've got, some, we've got quite a few fires, uh, mainly in the western slope of the uh, Rockies. Uh, we've got some, some big fires raging. and uh, Yeah, Jim, oh, wow. Jim's in Boulder, and it's really smoky up there. It's I'm not sorry to hear that terrible here where I am in Southeast Denver, but uh, it's not great either. Although it does make for, for some beautiful sunsets. Wow. Um, well, we had a couple weeks ago when I was doing a no fluff virtual workshop, uh, the day before that we had the remnants of that tropical storm sweep through and knock out all our power. And I was stuck using my phone as a Wi-Fi hotspot uh, on our generator too. And yet we were able to do the virtual workshop. So, you know, hey, nothing stops us here, right? Well, if nothing else, it's a testament to uh, what they've managed to accomplish with the Zoom platform. Yeah. So do you, uh, am, am I sharing my screen yet? Or are you seeing that? Yes. Or... Uh, so okay. we're seeing the, uh, the, the web page. So you might don't know if you've okay. got uh, demos or, or slides or, yeah. or what I've you got, want to throw there. I got both. Ooh. Now, yeah, isn't that nice? Now that this... Is. I should mention that I'm going to talk about Java and Groovy and Kotlin. So when I say functional programming in Java, we will do that. But I really want to expand it and talk about what's also available on the Groovy language and the Kotlin language, which both, you know, they both compile to the JVM. They both compile to bytecodes. So it's really more like functional programming on the JVM to a degree. I am going to focus on the Java stuff because that's what we'll do in our in our workshops. but. And I, for those people who might have seen me give this talk before, Bill, uh, I'll try to do different examples this time. So I have some different samples on some of that. So just letting you know. Uh, first of all, there's the my contact information. It, oh, and by the way, Michael, I'm gonna I can send you these slides. I'm not sure how you can make them available to people. You know what I think I'll do? Uh, I think I will extract a PDF out of these slides after we're done, and I'll upload the slides to the GitHub repository. You can see the link down here. This is the link for the GitHub repository that has all the code in it, 
that I'm going to be showing you. So right now it doesn't have the slides in it, but when I extract a PDF, I'll upload it there. You think that's the best way to get the slides to people? You're muted. That's probably smart. <laughs> At any rate, there's my contact information. If you need to get a hold of me or whatever, my name's Ken Cousin. It's Cousin Like the Relative, even though it doesn't look like it. There's my email address, homepage, blog, Twitter handle. Of course, uh, I've got a weekly newsletter, which is free if you're interested in that. And these are the books I've written in the past. So you see, I've written on Kotlin and Java and Groovy. So I have an interest in all three areas. And of course, inside the GitHub repository, I'm using a Gradle build file. So I kind of covered all the bases there. So I'm also, for what it's worth, a training certified training partner for Kotlin training by JetBrains, although we do Kotlin, a Kotlin virtual workshop on the No Fluff Tour as well. So uh, that would be included in your subscription if you're interested. I would do the same thing for Groovy if we had a program like that or even for Java, but so be it. Um, okay, now the thing about all three of these languages is they do compile to bytecodes. They're all compiling to bytecodes that run on the JVM. And none of these are what you would actually call functional languages. So I wouldn't call Java functional at all, or, or even Groovy or Kotlin, but they are OO languages that have functional features in them so that we can see the functional features wrapped in classes, if you will. Although in Kotlin, they use top level functions for a lot of these things. And in Groovy, they can use a mix. So Java, of course, I don't think anybody needs to be introduced to it, but just summarizing a couple of things about Java, it's 25 years old now, just at its anniversary, and it's managed by Oracle, but Oracle really manages the spec, and of course they produce a JDK, but you can also get JDKs from a variety of other vendors, the notable one being the Open JDK project, which is of course free and always will be. So Amazon on Amazon Web Services has their own implementation called Coretto and Azul Systems has a highly optimized one. There's a bunch of them out there and you can use any of them, of course, as long as they follow the spec. The functional features, the streams, the lambdas, the method references, they were all added in Java 1.8 and I'm gonna use Java 11 because that's the current long-term support version, as they say. But you can do everything in Java 1.8. I'm not going to use any features that go beyond that, although there are more. They haven't really fundamentally added new functional things in later versions since 1.8, although they've added methods to stream and methods that, you know, to the API that enhance some of the functional features. Nothing fundamentally different from what we've seen. Uh, Java 15 will be out next month. Uh, I forget the actual date, but that will only be of interest to people who are continually upgrading their JVM every six months, and I don't think that's a large number of people. Instead, the long-term support release is the one that guarantees three years of support. That's currently on 11, and that'll stay that way until 17, which will be out, I guess, if I think it through, a year from September, interestingly enough. Groovy started off as a separate programming language just as a private project. Actually, it was open source from the beginning. A few years ago, it became an Apache project. So it's a top level project at Apache. It's very easy syntax for Java developers to pick up. And in fact, most projects that use Groovy also use Java. So Groovy is basically used to enhance your Java experience. Now, before Java added any functional features at all, this was a really good way to get at them. There's still a lot of things Groovy can do that Java can't but the gap has gotten narrower. Um, the, a lot of the Groovy ecosystem involves projects like Grails or the Spock testing framework or Gradle and, and a few others. And I'm gonna use a Gradle build file and some Spock tests in there. Now Kotlin comes from JetBrains. That is the dominant language these days on Android. That was a decision made by, it's kind of hard, it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing. It's hard to know whether Google has set, agreed to that first or whether the community said, we need a language like this. And then Google went along with it. But either way, the if you're going to be an Android developer, you really do need to use uh, Android, uh, pardon me, you really need to learn Kotlin because I think it's something like 70% or more of the top 100 or top 1,000 Android apps are now written in Kotlin and that number is only expected to grow. Kotlin also provides a DSL inside of Gradle. So this is also giving it a little burst of of influence, of, of adoptability and everything. I, Kotlin recently upgraded to 1.4.0. I think it was like last week. And I, the GitHub repository I'm going to show you does in fact use the latest version of both Groovy and Kotlin and Java 11, as we say. 
So in Java, the functional features all kind of boil down to Lambda expressions, method references, and streams. And the concept is that in Java, we've always had the dominance of the nouns over the verbs. We've always had classes and you couldn't have a, a method outside of a class. So e that's why we get, give rise to awkward types of classes like, for example, the math class, which you never instantiate and has only static methods in it. But those are methods that in other languages would probably be global, if you will, max and min and sine and cosine absolute value. But in Java, of course, they had to go in a class somewhere, even if it's a class you don't ever instantiate. Well, now a Lambda expression is essentially a method that you can pass around like it was an object. You can assign it to variables. You can use it as arguments to other methods. You can use them as return types. And by allowing you to deal with methods directly rather than wrapping them in an artificial object sometimes, that really opens up a lot of possibilities. So instead of adding a class or an interface called Lambda, for example, which Java could have done, they decided to leverage their existing interface capability, but restricted to interfaces that only had a single abstract method in them, these SAM interfaces, so-called. And the idea is that if I have a Lambda expression, I could assign it to an interface reference and effectively think of it as the Lambda is the implementation of that single abstract method in the interface. If you want to imagine the compiler as generating a class to implement that interface and then using the Lambda as the implementation of that single abstract method, that's not actually a bad way to think about it. That works just fine. So it's the, the compiler is more optimized than that, obviously, but that is one way to consider it, interestingly enough. Now, the side point of this is you don't often, with a Lambda, even have to show the data types on the arguments for that method because they are inferred from that single abstract method inside the interface. So it looks weird when, when Java developers first see it, even though it's been out for several years, it's something that's still being adopted these days. Um, but you often see them without the parameter types inside. One of the things that makes Java lambdas kind of mushy, as opposed to closures, if you will, is that Java's got, you know, 25 years of backward compatibility to deal with. So what they do is that they, they say, this is a function that's able to see local parameters around it, local variables, say outside the Lambda, but still in the scope, but they can't modify them. Java uses the term final or effectively final for those parameters. And this is partly what distinguishes it from the other languages. In Groovy and in Kotlin, you can in fact even modify local variables. That makes these more closures. I mean, again, the, the distinction is not a, an official one, what a closure really means is it's, quote, closed over the execution environment. All the, the variables in scope are available to the Lambda. But in Java, you can't modify those variables. You can just read them. And in Groovy and Kotlin, you can modify them. Now, in Groovy, they call them closures, actually. And they, there's a class called closure. And each closure is an instance of this class. And then the closure actually has a property in it called delegate, which is searched if you put a variable or a method inside the closure that is not resolved locally. So I can call something that you don't see. And, and if you've ever worked with a Gradle build file, you see this sort of thing all the time. Like in the, the little section, here's a quick example over here. Here's my GitHub repository with my Gradle build file. So this is using the Groovy plugin, which also includes the Java plugin, and also Kotlin on the JVM. Because Kotlin can work with JavaScript or multi-platform, a lot of different possibilities. I'm sticking with the JVM. But you see this block here called repositories that has a method call in it called jcenter? Well, the way this is using a Groovy DSL in Gradle, this jcenter is actually a method call that's resolved on the delegate for this closure, this block here, which is called a um, repositories delegate. Actually, I think they actually, that, that's the name of the class and everything. And you can navigate inside if you know that class. So this is one of the things, by the way, we talk about in the, the Gradle discussions, but just let, you know, like in the, the we're going to have our no fluff virtual conferences and I have a, a talk on some of the Gradle uh, fundamentals, and that's going to be something we we'll talk about there. But this is the idea of building a DSL allows you to add in extra methods and properties that are resolved with the so-called delegate property on the Groovy closure. Groovy 
can modify local variables and everything. So these really are closures. Now Kotlin uses a Lambda expression, but they chose a completely different approach. They did not use interfaces. They did not use a closure class or anything like that. Instead, the data type of a Lambda looks like this. I mean, really like this. You have parentheses, and then in the parentheses, you have arguments that are class types and then an arrow, and then you have an argument that's the output type. And in a lot of Kotlin methods, you'll see that it takes an argument of this type, which means it's a lambda expression. Now in Kotlin, they refer to them as lambdas, and they, Kotlin lambda has something called a receiver. That's like the groovy delegate. Again, it's the class that is searched if you act, put a variable or a method inside the Lambda itself, and it's not resolved locally. It'll search the receiver. And that's how Kotlin is used to build DSLs as well. And that's how they built the Kotlin DSL for Gradle as well. Now, even though these are called Lambdas, they're really closures because you can not only access local variables, you can even modify them. So be it. Now, I have a series of demos that actually come from that uh, GitHub repository. But rather than dive into these right away, let me just show you, let me skip forward a little bit and show you a couple more slides and then I'll go directly to the code. One of the things that's different about Kotlin, which I miss when I go back to Java, is this idea of single function expressions. This sum method here, and in Kotlin, all methods have the fun keyword on them. So they're referred to as functions. It takes two arguments, A and B of type int. Notice that the type is declared after the variable in Kotlin, and then the return type is declared at the end of the signature. So this is a sum method that just adds A and B and returns an int. Well, in Kotlin, I can reduce that down to this form. See, the right-hand side is a single expression. Whatever that expression returns is the value of the function. So I don't need the return keyword, and I also don't even need the return type because that's inferred from this. So to give you a couple of examples, let me show you my prime number checker, for example. Now, this is kind of a brute force one. It's not really um, efficient or anything. So the one for Java, let's see if I, oops, sorry, wrong, wrong words here. So here's my prime checker in Java. And speaking of functional programming, this would be the old style and then I'll show you the new style. So this is a prime number checker for Java 7. It takes a number. It says, if it's less than two, I'll throw an illegal argument exception. If it's equal to two, that's prime. Otherwise, I'll form a limit, which is the square root of the number rounded up, basically. And I'll loop from two up to that limit, trying to divide by each, each number all the way up to that limit. And if it divides any of them evenly, then it's not prime, otherwise it is. And there's a, I need test cases for this because I have no confidence in my ability to write code like this without testing it to make sure it's right. There's just too many chances for off by one errors and things like that. So this again is not efficient because I'm just dividing by every single number up to the square root. But here's the functional approach to it. This is how we would write it now. So I still check for the illegal argument exception. I still get the limit, but now we have streams. An int stream, a stream of lowercase ints, I-N-T, has a range close method that takes a, let's see if I mouse over this, a start inclusive up to an end inclusive. So this goes from two up to the limit. And then there's a method on stream called none match that takes a predicate. This is a predicate is one of the functional interfaces that was added in Java. And it takes a single argument and returns true or false. So here I have a lambda expression. So we take n, that's each number in this range, and try to divide x by n using the modulus operator. And if it evenly divides any of them, then this will be false because none match only returns true if none of the elements of the stream match this predicate. So you can see how the idiom is a little bit different now in Java by using streams and lambdas. And I'm not using a method reference here, but the basic idea. Now, in Groovy, to look at that one instead, it looks very similar, but some of the names of the methods are different. So here I have a class, and in Groovy, classes are public by default, so I don't have to say public, and methods are public by default, and attributes are private by default. So again, I don't need any of that. I'm saying I have a method that takes an int and returns a Boolean. Again, this code looks just like Java. That's why I say it's easy for Java developers to learn Groovy because the syntax is so close. 
Likewise here, I can form the, the square, the limit again, but I don't need the return keyword because the last evaluated expression is returned automatically. So I'll just say if X is two, return true, or this is called a range in Groovy and Kotlin has something similar. So this goes from two up to that limit inclusive. And instead of using a method called uh, filter, in Groovy, it's called find or find all. Find all would return all the elements that match this closure, but find returns the first one. So I'm only looking for the first element that satisfies this closure. And if I don't find any of them, then the number's prime. Otherwise, it's composite. And you see that the difference in syntax with Groovy and Kotlin syntax, by the way, will be identical to this in terms of the closures. The syntax in in Groovy uses the braces to surround the entire expression. That's different from the Java world, but identical to the Kotlin one. So this again is taking N and looking for X mod N equals equals zero to find the first one where that's, that's satisfied. Now, I have a test case for this. And this in fact is a Groovy Spock test, extend specification. And you see, I've got both the Java prime checker and the groovy one here and i can run through expecting all of these to be prime this is the java uh, sorry this is the java 7 one this is the the new functional one this is the groovy one and i can try it for a range of prime numbers and a range of composite numbers to make sure these are not prime and also i can check that when i put in anything from minus two up to one i will throw an illegal argument exception so just to execute that, just to show that works too, then you'll see the nice output popping out of this. And if I ran this in a Gradle build file, you'd see a different line for each one of these numbers. Actually, you see them here. Uh, two is prime, three is prime, five is prime, et cetera, all the way up, up to the ones that throw the illegal argument exception. So that's Java's approach and Groovy's approach. And then Kotlin's approach is here. uh this one so in kotlin here i actually have a couple of different methods but i also have something that goes beyond what i just showed here's my is prime method but i've done something interesting with it this is something that groovy could do but java could not i have made is prime an extension function on the int class so int is jo is kotlin's version of integer and by writing the function where I go int dot is prime, what I'm doing is I'm saying now integer will have a function on it called is prime. And then I'm using my single statement expression again to say this, which is the current int is two or, and now this is another thing that's kind of unique to Kotlin. These are top level functions, ceiling and square root. And these are functions that are declared inside um, a class by themselves or inside of a file by themselves. They're not in a class is a question. Does that become global for all instances of int? Yes, it does. And, but it does do this at compile time at least. So this is not only when I'm executing the code, it does happen when you compile it, but it, yes, it does in fact add a method to int throughout the, the, I guess you'd say throughout that JVM is the way it would work on that. Uh, and that's interesting and possibly dangerous, as you might imagine. It's the old Spider-Man corollary with great power comes great responsibility there. any rate, like these are top level functions declared in the library. So I'm actually importing functions, which looks a little weird to Java people, but think of them as static methods in a class. See what Kotlin did is they don't actually have the keyword static. So instead of having static methods in a class, they just put the function at the top level and you just import the function. You see, it's still scoped to a package and everything. So this is now also, this is another quirk of Kotlin. Whereas in Java, I could just say the square root of an integer and it would work in Java and in Groovy. In Kotlin, it would not because the square root function requires a double and my value is an integer. Now in Java, we promote an int to a double and nobody'd be surprised. But again, if you think of them in terms of classes, you can't just convert a capital I integer into a capital D double by assignment, even in Java. You still need to invoke a method to do the conversion. And that's why here I have to take the int and convert it to a double, do the square root, go to the ceiling to round up, 
and then convert back into an int for my int range here. And then again, the method this time is called none instead of none match. And there we have it. And there's a few other mechanisms too. So this is basic idea of how the languages treat basic Lambda expressions. Now in Java, we have streams and streams are a layer of indirection, if you will. They didn't add all the functional methods to collections themselves. Instead, they said, let's make this intermediate. It's the old cliche, every problem in computer science is solved by adding a layer of indirection, you know? Oh, you know, before I go too far on that, let me give you something useful for this class. Uh, here's the prime number joke. So this is a gag you can reuse if it's of any help to you. Um, one question math test, prove or disprove all the odd numbers are, are prime. And a mathematician would go, well, three is prime and five is prime and therefore by induction, all odd numbers are prime. Uh, that's funny if, you're, if you know a lot of math. Uh, the physicist goes, three is prime, five is prime, seven is prime, oh, nine. That could be experimental error. 11 is prime, 13 is prime. Yeah, that's gotta be enough. You know. The engineer goes, three is prime, five is prime, seven is prime, nine is prime, 11 is prime, 13 is prime. The computer scientist says, three is prime, five is prime, five is prime, five is prime, five is prime. And of course the manager uh, goes, two is prime, four is prime, six is prime, eight is prime. Yeah. Any rate, there's your prime number joke. Feel free to reuse that uh, however you like. Okay. now. Java added this layer of indirection called streams. And that's a good thing in that the values in the stream don't necessarily have to come from a collection. They could come from a variety of sources. But the, what's unique about streams is that the streams are lazy. The values can come through one at a time, go through the entire pipeline. And if something in the pipeline short circuits, you can leave that stream entirely. So you only process as much data as needed. Now, Groovy added those various methods like none match and or all those other methods I was talking about directly to collection. So those are eager. That'll process everything in the collection. But if you want to get stream behavior in Groovy, you just call the stream method and use the Java API because you could just call Java methods and Java classes in Groovy and use them. So Groovy didn't feel the need to re-implement everything in Groovy. You just use the Java approach. Kotlin, on the other hand, decided to re-implement it all. And in Kotlin, they have what they call sequences, which look like this. So as an example of the stream behavior, here is my lazy streams demo in Java, first of all. So you can see here, I have, actually, let me scroll down to this. This is to say, I want the first even number between 100 and 200 that's divisible by three. Again, it's a very contrived problem, so the answers aren't really all that relevant. But just showing the idea here, I'm doing an int stream with a range from 100 to 200. So range would be non-inclusive. So that's from 100 to 199, range closed to be inclusive. I'm filtering them with a predicate. So I only want the values that are divisible by three, and then map is taking a function. And those are two of the functional interfaces that were added in Java 1.8. And in the course, of course, we go through those in some detail. And then find first is a method on stream that returns an optional. And then you have to get into that whole issue of what the heck's an optional. And optional is basically a wrapper around a single object, or it can be an empty optional if the result was null. So the idea here is that what if I had filtered out every value from the range? That's what find first is saying. I mean, here I'm not, but say I had accidentally filtered them all out, then find first is going to return an empty optional because there is no first. Whereas if there is a value, find first will just wrap it. And then the or else method on optional will say, either give me the value back if there is one, or if it's an empty optional, return zero, or maybe I should have picked a different error code. Now I can execute this and it, it's, it'll work, but it won't show you the individual values being printed. So I've got a different version of it down here, which has a filter using method reference syntax, divide by three and multiply by two. And these are those methods. So multiply by two up here, takes an int, returns an int, and doubles it, but in between identifies that we're in the method. Likewise, divide by three, checks the modulus, and returns a Boolean, but prints out the method. Now, if I look at the test case on this, 
And I've got a spec here that's doing this in Java. And of course, I also have a Groovy implementation. And the problem with Groovy is the map method is called collect in Groovy, which is kind of sad, but it came before Java had already grabbed the collect method. Before Java adopted the collect method for a reduction operation, Groovy had already said, let's call it map. And I know if they had to do over, they call it map. But there's a find again to return the first one. And here's the verbose version with the print line inside. But notice this is not using a stream. These are methods applied directly to a range, if you will. But here, I went and wrote the Java code in Groovy with a Groovy closure. So wherever they were expecting a functional interface, I provided a Groovy closure, and that works just as well. So to demonstrate this operating, let me run the, the tests here. Oops, wrong keyboard shortcut. There we go. And what you'll see is the first even divisible by three is in fact 204, and that works on both of these. But if I want to see it in verbose fashion, then in the Java world, see, this is using a stream. I'm only doing four calculations entirely. But in Groovy, it went through the whole collection, doubling the values and then doing the modulus. Now, I could have simplified that by doing the modulus first and then doubling. But still, I mean, it's, it's still verbose. But if I use the streams approach, yeah, I'm back to, again, just doing the lazy operations that way. So the streams were put in there to allow you to do this laziness and going through a pipeline and having intermediate operations and terminal operations, all those things. And Groovy lets you use them directly, but Java has that as a fundamental mechanism inside it. Now, Kotlin uses sequences for that. And if I looked at lazy sequences or well, here, I'll just show you the code in this case. I'll show you what a sequence looks like in Kotlin. And their reduction operations are either called reduce or fold. So here, again, is the Java code with a filter, a map, and a reduce. Notice the arguments to reduce here are either an, uh, an initial value and a binary operator or just, actually, this is the sum method. There's also a reduce method that takes just the binary operator. Here is a built-in sum method. This is using map to int to create an int stream, which has a sum method, whereas regular stream does not. So this would be a stream of integer. It's not showing here, but I, when I created the stream, it'd be a stream of integer. This is an int stream and therefore has a sum method if I want to add them up, for example. And here would be the groovy approach with the find all and then collect and then inject of all things as opposed to using sum as well. And Groovy takes advantage of what they call duck typing, meaning the compiler leaves it alone. And if the method's there at runtime, it works, period. That's what the Ruby people call duck typing, as in if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So if it has a sum method, great, it works. If it doesn't, we'll get an exception. And in Kotlin, they still use filter and map. And here they use fold if there's two arguments, the initial value and the lambda, or it would actually be called reduce if we only used one argument. I didn't show an example of that. So I don't know why they, they switched method names on that, but they did. And notice these are all being applied on the collection itself. So these are those eager ones. If it's a one argument closure or one argument lambda, and you don't specify the argument name, it defaults to the word it, and that's exactly what they do in Groovy. Here's what it would look like with a sequence. You just throw an as, as sequence on it, and now it behaves exactly like a, a Java stream. All right. So Java and Groovy and Kotlin all have these Lambda expressions and method reference equivalents and closures, I mean, and uh, pardon me, and streams in some way, you know, in one fashion or another, and then we'll be able to go beyond it. Now, before I do that, since I don't want to take too much time, let me show you a couple of interesting bigger examples, if you will. So this is an example that I created because I was reading the newspaper. Here's today's Hartford Current, and I'm looking on the comics page, and they have a daily jumble. And here are the words to be unscrambled. And then, of course, you've got the big one down here. But let's ignore the big one down here for a moment. And the idea would be to figure out what the word is for each of these. And I would stare at these things and go, geez, you know, sometimes I get it. Usually the five letter words are pretty easy. Like I imagine somebody's already solved this one by now. You know, that's pretty quick. Um, 
I've got that one too. So those I can see, I can generally find the five letter words pretty quickly. The six letter words take a little bit more work inside there. And I realized that I can actually write a jumble solver. Now on a Mac, which is based on BSD Unix ultimately, on all versions of BSD Unix, there is a list of words that comes from Webster's Second International Dictionary, copyright 1934. And the copyright has expired. So they just add it as a word list. And I realized what I need to do is to take each clue here and find all permutations of those letters, form that as a word, and search the word list for them. And then I can have my own jumble solver. So here in my source code, let me close all these. And what I've done is under source main resources, I actually have that dictionary. I actually copied the whole thing into my project. And here you can see the word list. There are about 235,000 words in this word list. So because it's copyrights expired and everything, I just copied the whole thing in. Now in Java, the way I'm solving this problem is the following. Let me make this full screen here. So I'm going to make a map of words to lists of strings that map to this. Actually, this will be a clue. And the clue will be a string. And then I want a list of words that map to that clue. Now, the question is, what do I put in for the clue? And I was talking to a friend of mine who's really good at algorithms. That's uh, Tim Yates, by the way. And he suggested taking the word, the clue that they gave me, and alphabetizing it and then using that as the key in the map. And then the list will be all words that are unscrambled by that clue that are also in the, in the dictionary. So here's the mechanism to do this. The lines method in the files class, this is Java's new IO, takes a path and returns a stream of strings. So I have a stream of words, basically, pulling one word per line. So it's each line in the file becomes an element of the stream. I'm going to filter those out of the dictionary. I only need the words with length five or six because the jumble is only based on five or six letter clues. And then the collect here is to transform back into a collection. In this case, I'm using grouping by and taking the word and alphabetizing it. So this word to key says for each word here, down here, I put in a private method that converts the, the string and I, into a stream by splitting it at, well, no space at all. So this will give me a stream of individual letters. I sort them alphabetically. And then I, yeah, exactly. You, you get the idea. So uh, I'm just re responding to something in the chat. So at any rate, collect here will join them back together. So this creates my key. Take a word, convert it to a key by splitting it up, sorting it, and then joining it back together. And again, you can see the stream mechanisms going on here to make that easy. So with my group by, I'll wind up with a map of clues to words that map to that. So here's my solver. There's a method called get or default. So get would be get on a map, you know, just to return the, the key. So I just put in my key here or put in my clue, convert it to a key and get it. But get or default says, oh yeah, otherwise I'll just return an empty list, basically a singleton list here. So my solver is gonna return all the words of the dictionary that map to that. And in parallel, see this is one of the advantages of streams. I can throw a parallel in there and now solve this for all the arguments that are presented inside it. And to show you the test case for this, here's my test case. And I've got like, this is unscrambles to actual, and this unscrambles to goalie. It's words like this that were driving me crazy that, that got me to write the solver. This is an assert all from JUnit 5. So this is still JUnit, it's JUnit 5 that takes a couple of executables. Those are functional interfaces again. And right here, I can check the solver by doing those individually. The beauty, the beauty of assert all is even if the first one fails, the second one would run. Here on the parallel solve, I can put in multiple words and print them out. And then I could check that it contains in any order. Actually, let me run it and I'll show you what, it, what I get out of this. And you see that there are my, here's my three words that I'm, that I'm proposing. And they unscramble to amaze and crowd. And apparently this unscrambles to both flaunt and unflat, which, okay, 
I don't think that's the clue they meant, you know, that idea. So you see how with a functional pro programming approach, I can do something like this. Now for the record, I also have a groovy one. So the, the groovy one looks like this. I throw a compile static on there to make it faster. But here I've got a read lines method to read all the words out of the dictionary and a group by, and this is groovy's equivalent of a method reference. So here's the word to key method. I take the word, convert it to a list, sort it, join it back up. And with my group by, again, I get a map of string to list of words, and then I just access a value in the map, for example. So that works too. And in Kotlin, to show you that one, uh, sorry, jumble, dot KT, here's how I did it. There's a method in Kotlin called use lines, which will read, like in the groovy read lines one, this will read out all the lines of the file as a sequence and then close the file when we're done. Just like the groovy read lines method will close the file when we're done. So I don't need the try catch block or the finally or try with resources or anything there. So this says, great, let's read the lines and filter them by length. And then again, I've got my group by operation. And again, I have a single expression with my word to key mechanism. And here's the single element solver and here's the parallel solver. Or actually, this doesn't do parallel. This is just solving all. And what I did is, in fact, I took this class. And not only did I compile it, I used the Grawl JVM, the one from Oracle, that allows me to have a native image calculation. And in fact, what I can show you is, uh, let me clear that, I compiled it to an executable. So let's see, what were the words they said here? Uh, o E O S G and G A. Well, actually, somebody wrote them in there, didn't they? So O E O S G and uh, sorry, what was it again? G A I E M, G A I E M, and then dual G S. That's easy to write. Okay, D U E L G S, and then finally i r x l i e so i r x l i e and bang now you see the beauty of com do it using the native image compiler from grawl is that you saw how fast that was is that that's actually a native program now on my unix system and i'm able to run that and it turns out that they wanted elixir of course as as a brand figured out but there are and i can run that on any jumble i want the only thing i can't figure out how to do yet is figure out this overall big solution here but eh, i'm sure there's an algorithm i just haven't gotten it yet so at any rate you see how that's using the functional features of all three languages to solve various interesting problems now there's more to this let me go on past the pogos and stuff uh, and the data classes if you go beyond what java can do then we have these ideas of closure composition or memoization, tail recursion, currying, things that are more advanced in the functional languages. Java can't really do these. It could do a little bit of closure composition. This is how it does closure composition. In fact, let me show you over here. Um, here is the Java JDK. And if I look at, say, consumer, that's that functional interface I was telling you about. A consumer has an abstract method called accept that takes a single value and returns void. But notice this composition method. It's called and then. It takes a consumer and returns a new consumer that runs the current one and then the argument. That's why they called it after. So you can compose two consumers together. Or on predicate, so here's predicate, you can use there's the single abstract method, but they have and, and they have or, and and is a short circuiting predicate, if you will. So if the, you build up a composite predicate that runs the first one, and then the second one, and if the first one fails, there's no need to run the second one. And we also have a not and an or and all that. So the problem with this is that it's not working for arbitrary lambdas because there's no such thing as an arbitrary lambda in java it has to be associated with a functional interface and you can write your own functional interface but it's still not going to be as general as in groovy being able to do very powerful things so here if i look in my uh composition uh shoot i think it's under java composition uh what did i call it oh combine lambdas sorry yeah i figured wrong word combine lambdas. So here, for example, is an array list with a bunch of nulls in it. 
So I can make a predicate that checks for nulls. That's the non-null method in the objects class, which returns true if something's non-null and false otherwise. I can make a predicate that looks for even lengths just by saying for each string, get the length mod two equals equals zero. That's either true or false. I can write a consumer that's associated with a logger, the info method on a logger, and a consumer that prints to the console. And by going through this stream, I could filter them by doing null filter dot and evens, and then for each logger and then printer. And if I execute this, that's just a regular main method. You'll see that here is the consumer with the print to the console after doing the filtering out the nulls and getting the even length strings. And then here, these info messages are using the logger. So it's doing, it says logger and then printer, but we've got a race condition going on with the console. And apparently the system.out got there first <laughs> rather than system.air, which is what loggers use. So there's the limited closure composition in, in uh, Groovy. Yes, these are all in a GitHub repository, which I, I mentioned at the beginning, but I'll also show you at the end as well. Now, in Groovy, we have arbitrary closures like this, and I have a left shift and a right shift operator. And this allows you to build a composite closure just by saying, apply the times method, then apply add three. And you can see there I can execute it. And five times two is, is 10, and then adding three is 13. Or here you can see them done individually. I could also do it in reverse order, but then I have to put in my parentheses for precedence. And you see that mechanism is built right in. What about Kotlin? Well, Kotlin doesn't actually have that sort of thing. What Kotlin has is the ability to write it. I took this from the reference docs. So this compose method takes three functions, F, G, and actually two functions, F and G, and it returns a function. This is what they call higher order functions in the functional programming world. And I've got three generic types, A, B, and C. So this says function, the first function, F, transforms a B into a C. The second function, G, transforms an A into a B. And by applying F of G of X, I transform an A into a C. So here is an example. The length function takes a string and returns an integer. The is odd function takes an integer, and returns a Boolean, to see whether it's odd or not. And then I could do compose here, which references is odd and length. And then I could take my list and say, okay, filter by odd length, my composed function, and print them out. So that works too. But that's kind of awkward. I mean, they had to build it themselves. So I think the idea is Java has closure composition, but it's very limited because we're talking about strictly defined functional interfaces. We don't ha we have to pick a data type and we have to work with it. And they don't have anything that's really kind of arbitrary or powerful. Any functionality beyond that, you have to write yourself. Groovy lets you use pretty arbitrary closures and do composition with them. Kotlin has the mechanisms built in, but no operator or simple method for it. I think that's because Kotlin's just younger than the others. By the time Kotlin hits version two or three, I'll bet they have something like that too. It's just that right now they don't. So there's your composition approach. And then there's other things like uh, tail recursion, which Groovy does through a so-called abstract syntax tree transformation, or Kotlin does through a keyword. And that allows you to write tail recursive algorithms that reuse the stack frames. Java, you can write the algorithm in a tail recursive fashion, but it doesn't reuse the stack frames. It's still, it still can overflow. What tail recursion does, if you haven't seen it in a while, is it's a way to transform recursive method calls into iterative ones by reusing previous results. Groovy also has annotations like at memoize, which will create a map of results to arguments. See, if you have what's called a pure function in functional programming, that means it always returns the same answer given the same arguments. And that means it's not dependent on anything outside and doesn't have any side effects. That's a pure function. Well, in Groovy, if you throw an at memoize on it, then what it'll do is said, oh, you ran this function with a two and this is the result you got. I'll put that in a map. So next time you call that function with a two, I'll just give you the result from the map. And by doing that, you could do Fibonacci calculations, which are recursive and, and not overflow because you, it, it remembers all the previous results. And, you know, the Fibonacci of N is the Fibonacci of the previous two leading to that, that, that other gag. Uh, this year's Fibonacci conference is going to be as good as the last two combined, right? 
Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, any rate, there, I could show you that. It's in the GitHub repository. However, I know what you're really here for. What you really want to see are, of course, uh, cat pictures. But actually, I have time to do one more little suggestion. So before I do that, here, the annotated functions with the tail recursion and the memoize, those are in here. And the test is, I think, a JUnit 5 test that executes these. So if you look for them in the GitHub repository, those are the names of the classes. If you want to do functional programming in Kotlin that goes beyond what the language provides, oh, question, how big a map, how often does it get cleaned up? Which map are you referring to? Oh, the Memoize map? It's, I don't know how often it gets cleaned up because I haven't looked at the code inside Memoize recently. The size of that map is the, it has an entry for each time you invoke the method. So just think of it as having a number of entries, not each time you invoke the method, each time you invoke the method with unique arguments. So it's basically keeping track of invocations with unique arguments. So if you invoke that method with unique arguments 10, 10 million times, yeah, you could wind up with a problem, I guess. But if you did it with 10, then it's going to be really quick. I can tell you that my Fibonacci calculator with the memo eyes on it, I've invoked it with Fibonacci numbers you know, in the tens of thousands and therefore give results that I don't even print out. I just say the size of this has a couple hundred thousand digits to it, you know, that sort of thing. So I don't know what the actual implementation is, although I assume they're using some kind of linked hash map inside. I don't know what, what the cleanup is, although I presume it's the same as anything else on the JVM there. I don't know if there's anything special, but so far I've had really good behavior with it. It's worked really nicely. And of course, if you don't like it, you could always write your own on that. So again, I'm responding to a comment in the chat box here. Um, here, I want to show, uh, let me skip that. And then actually I could show, now nah, I guess let's go directly to the cat pictures, especially because somebody's got to run here. So let me give you that. Now, the idea with the cat pictures is that there is, Flickr has an API for invoking searches on it. Now it's really, ugly from a restful point of way. Uh, what about monoids or monads? Let me just comment on that real quick. Java's never really going to have monads in it because while it does have a flat map method, which is required for that, Java doesn't have any way of enforcing nullability or rather non-nullability. Java's got that problem with nulls. And that's an issue because part of the monad monoid approach is going to be what happens if this is null and what happens if it's not null. And we'd love to be able to just restrict that. So Java is never really going to have that. Groovy kind of has it, but not really. And then Kotlin, actually, one of its biggest selling points is that when you make a variable in Kotlin, you can say this can never be null. Or rather, it's always assumed to be non-null unless we put in a nullable indicator on it. And that's something similar to Scala again, you know, the idea there. So in Kotlin, in principle, you could have monads. And in that arrow library that I was mentioning before, they discuss the idea of monads in Kotlin. So if you're interested, take a look at the documentation of the arrow library, and they'll talk about monads there. So in Java, they'll never quite get to that point, but they can use a lot of the same ideas, even without having, strictly speaking, monads. They can still do functional programming concepts. They can try to work with immutability. See, Groovy has an add immutable AST transform, which will enforce immutability to the level that you can on the JVM and say these objects cannot change. That will help out a lot of the functional concepts as well. And, and you can work with Java parallel streams, which I'm about to do with the cat pictures in a moment. So it's you know, they're never all getting there. If, if functional programming is your real goal, if that's really all you care about, then go to Haskell, frankly. And Haskell on the JVM is called Frege, F-R-E-G-E. And that's basically Haskell syntax directly on the JVM. But if you want to use Scala, use Scala. But I'm preferring, I like Kotlin a lot better in many ways for that. Okay. Only, okay. So um, let me show you the cat pictures here. And thank you to Bill for an assist on this. Bill Fly, actually, is my friend here. So I have this cat pictures one. And this is going to use Groovy and Java together with parallel streams. So the idea here is this script, this is just a script that is going to actually, yeah, Haskell on the JVM is, uh, it's called F-R-E-G-E -E is Haskell on the JVM. 
uh, got to make sure I say that to everyone there. There you go. So just Google that or Google Frega Java or whatever, and it'll take you directly to the web page there. Any rate, this is the RESTful web service for Flickr. And you actually put in a method, which again, the, the people who are fond of REST are appalled by this, that you actually have a method name in the URL, because this is going to be a map that's going to be assembled to do query parameters. So I'll do a Flickr photo search. I've got my key. I want JSON data coming back. I'm going to search on cats. And I want photos back. In fact, I want six of them. This collect with a join basically will take this map here and assemble a query string out of it because the two string method on an entry is key equals value. So that'll join them all together. I put together my URL using the interpolation in strings, which works both in Groovy and Scala, uh, Scala and Kotlin as well, and convert it to a URL, get the data from Flickr and I'll write it to a file. So you'll see the, the JSON data coming out. Here, Groovy has a JSON parser, which they call a JSON slurper. They also have a JSON parser, but this one's nice, which will parse that text into an actual map with entries and everything. So I can drill down to the photo elements out of this. And then here, the idea is to take each photo element and convert it to an instance of Java's image class so I can put it inside a J label, if you will. So take each photo. I'm going to print out the thread I'm on just to let you know. And in the Flickr API, this is the URL for each image that's assembled from the photo element in the JSON structure. So I'm going to all the keys inside the JSON structure, the properties there, and assemble this URL. I convert it to a URL. I read it. And here you can see in parallel, what the heck, let's do it in parallel, download all the images from all the photos and collect them back into a list. And then in this, in, in Groovy, is called a swing builder. It will build a J frame with a title and a grid layout and a close operation. And for each image, I'll wrap the image in an image icon and put it on a J label. Again, the, the danger here is I don't know what I'm going to get exactly. It's the latest six pictures at Flickr that are tagged with the word cats. But let's take a chance. And Bill has asserted to me that it should be okay. Let's find out. Okay, who knows what that one is, but well, that's, I guess you could call that a cat. It's a leopard, I suppose. There's a cat. There's a cat in there with a dog too. There's a cat. I, I'm counting that as a win. Because, <laughs> you know, I've gotten some really awkward stuff out of this. I've gotten all kinds of things. But again, if you want to experiment with it, just play around with the, the tag here and search on whatever, you oh, cheetah, yeah, rather than that. Um, yeah, okay, so whatever. Now, let me again summarize and give you the GitHub repository. So you can use all these languages together. See, I have them all in the same project. And in fact, I have Java and Groovy working together a lot because frankly, that's inevitable. <laughs> I mean, I, you can add Groovy to Java easily, but adding Java to Groovy is always because they use the same libraries and, Every major system I've seen with Groovy has Java in it. Java is good for basic infrastructure and tools and libraries like Spring or Hibernate. And Groovy and Kotlin go beyond that to add additional functional features and AST transforms and you know the DSL capabilities and everything. So the Java functional capabilities do take a little bit of getting used to. Streams, lambdas, method references, the functional interfaces, the limited composition mechanisms. And we cover all that in the, in the functional programming one in our uh, virtual workshop. Groovy goes beyond them. They have builders and parsers and metaprogramming and traits and all those transformations. Kotlin doesn't go quite as far beyond, but has some nice features to it. And all those demos are in this GitHub repository under my name as Java underscore Groovy underscore Kotlin. And again, back here, uh, there's all my contact information, including the GitHub repository. I'm going to, when we're done, I'm going to take this presentation, extract it as a PDF, and I'll upload it to that GitHub repository as well. So you'll be able to access whenever you like. So again, feel free to contact me whenever you like. And there's my newsletter and Twitter handle and everything. If you have any questions, I'll hang out for a few minutes, but otherwise that's uh, what I want to talk to you about. So how are you doing, Michael? Is everything good there? Oh, things are good on my end. Uh, this cool. was, this was some, some, uh, some good and eye-opening stuff. There's 
a lot that's been happening in the groovy and uh, Kotlin space that I have not been keeping up with. So certainly <laughs> I appreciate that. And it looks like uh, coming in on the chat, just a, uh, just a few thank yous. I haven't seen any questions come in yet, but if you've got questions, feel free to uh, uh, drop them into the chat. Otherwise, uh, we will probably wrap up soon. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming. And hopefully I'll see you at a No Fluff virtual workshop at some point. Uh, I'm using Swing in Groovy at the moment They're, because they have a Swing builder built in. That's what the question is in the in the chat there. I know that there's JavaFX and I could probably use the JavaFX API directly. I don't think there's a JavaFX builder in Groovy for that to simplify it. You know, DSL based on JavaFX. I'm not good at JavaFX yet and yet I I go back far enough in the Java world that I remember using Swing. <laughs> so I had a sense of how to make that work. And that's why I use Swing in there. Okay. A lot to catch up with Groovy. Well, that's if you're interested. You know, again, if you're an Android person, yeah, you'll want to learn Kotlin. It, if you want to learn Groovy, you can. The Spring framework works with all three languages. The Micronaut microservice framework works with all three languages. You know, so you get to pick and choose whichever you happen to prefer. Well, and I always have a soft spot for Groovy. I used to have a t-shirt that said, if I was coding Groovy, I'd be home by now. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my goodness. Um, Groovy, for me, I'd say it falls in the category of being a first love kind of thing. I mean, I was a Java person since the mid-90s. But I found Groovy right around 2006, seven time frame maybe. And mm -hmm. I used it for intensively for several years and I still use it off and on when opportunity comes up. I've always liked it. It's powerful, it's dangerous, but it's easy to understand. The community is extremely friendly, especially to beginners. So I really am very fond of it and it's still an active project. It's just, it's very quiet. You just don't hear much about it because the people in it tend to be not very good at self-promotion, to be honest with you. And that's, that's nice, you know? So I like that community. Kotlin I learned because of Android and because of Gradle. And then I, I like the language as well. And as I say, I'm a training partner for it. I do enjoy it. But yeah, Groovy's kind of a first love there. Uh, when would I use the functional aspects of Java over Groovy? Um, if I'm working with existing Java infrastructure or libraries, like, like Spring's never going to be rewritten in Groovy because you don't have to. Spring works with lambdas and method references and everything, and I need to know the functional features of Java so I can work with their functional approaches. Or JUnit, for example, has a functional interface in it and works with you know, suppliers and other functional interfaces that come from Java. So I'm effectively working with the Java part when I use these third-party libraries and infrastructure. Spring, again, the, the framework's written in Java, but you can write your code in Kotlin, and they have a couple of DSLs as well, like for doing um, with a, when, you, when you do what they call functional endpoints. When you write your web app, you can write a bean that's just the navigation uh, routing diagram. And Kotlin made a nice little DSL for that. Whereas in Java, you have to write out the methods. So, you know, do you recommend we use Java with Kotlin and not for Android? I would say that if you, that, that you're never going to go wrong by learning Java, especially the functional features in Java. That's going to be the most opportunities for everything. If you're going to go into Android, you really need to learn Kotlin. If you want to learn Kotlin or Groovy, then that's fine. And uh, it depends on what your use cases are, what's going to drive you in a particular direction. I learned Groovy because I wanted to learn Grails. And Grails was a framework built on top of Spring and Hibernate and really simplified life. Micronaut as well lets you use all three languages and you could pick and choose and therefore learn things gradually if you like. So it's if you don't have to learn Kotlin, um, this will be an interesting year actually because we'll find out if people decide if Kotlin starts to break out of that community and starts becoming bigger on the overall JVM, it'll, it'll be provided. One mechanism would be all those Android developers saying, Hey, I want to do Kotlin on the server side too. And then I'll say, well, there's spring boot. There's KTOR as a Kotlin library. There's Micronaut for microservices. We'll see if that starts catching on the Kotlin people are pushing their multi-platform approach, the ability to generate JavaScript or to generate mobile apps on both, Android and iOS. Again, we'll see whether that catches on or not. Uh, is what about Vaver uh, or Joule? I have not. I've seen Vaver, and Vaver is very nice, but um, it's just another library. It doesn't 
change how I do things. Uh, Jewel, I've seen, but I don't know it yet. And it looks very promising, actually. So yeah, there are libraries to go beyond what Java offers as a baseline. And that is that is a good place to keep an eye on. I think Dan Hinojosa used to have a talk on Vavr. Uh, or maybe I first heard about Vavr. By the way, if you, if you like Vavr, if you don't know what I'm talking about there, look at the word Vavr and turn it upside down. Okay, because it was a library whose name was based on Java, and then Oracle got to them and said, you can't use the word Java. So they flipped the word upside down and they called it Vavr. <laughs> so I, I, I'm in favor of them just for that. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. I have, I've only heard about Joule. I've never actually used it yet. If you like it, if you think it's really good, let me know. You know? Uh, I don't have a compelling use case, by the way, to use Scala, as inflammatory as that sounds. I, I don't have any reason I need to learn Scala, which is why I haven't. Now, if you want to, the person I know, of course, speaking of no fluff speakers, it's Venkat Subramaniam, who knows everything about everything, has a book on Scala, has a book on Groovy, has a book on Java, has a book on Kotlin. You know, he's got everything. Uh, I'd ask him as to how Scala compares in all of these things. I don't know Scala well enough to compare, but I can tell you a lot of Kotlin was taken directly from Scala. It really is. It was assembled from pieces, and that was one of the pieces inside it. Any other questions, comments, words of wisdom? Heard any good jokes lately? How about this one? As long as we're dumping on programming languages. Um, a million monkeys on a million typewriters will eventually type a Java program, uh, and the rest will be Perl programs. Let's see if we have any Perl defenders in here still hanging out. <laughs> yeah, again, feel free to reuse any of these gags. Be my guest. Did I just drive a bunch of people away? <laughs> any rate. So enjoy. I'll update the GitHub repository. I don't think I changed anything during our talk, uh, during this webinar. So it should be fine as is. If I do update it, I'll push, push some changes to it. I will add this PDF to it. That's all I'm going to change there. Well, right on. Well, thank you. Uh, first, thank you, Ken, for your time and sharing your expertise with us. And for all the folks who are still on the call, thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. Yes, thank you very much for coming. Take care.